Evolution happens all the time, even if we don't notice it. It's necessary for any living organism to exist in this world and keep up with its changes. But there is one but. Today, you're going to learn why herbivores grow fangs, why animals are afraid of evolution, and how nature can rob anyone of their uniqueness. Let's go. Yes, if there's any powerful yet completely indifferent force in the world, it's nature. Nature can take from any living creature whatever it wants – home, behavioral features, even body parts. But if it all seems to make no sense to you, look closely. In fact, nature has its own logic. Take this bird as an example – the Galapagos flightless cormorant, which lives only on two islands in the world. Actually, there are 21 species of cormorants on the planet, but it's these poor creatures that nature has deprived of the ability to fly. Just compare those two different species. See these wings? They don't work. At all. If the wings help penguins somehow, then for flightless cormorants, they're like an unnecessary accessory, which is a pity to throw away. The explanation is quite simple. When you live where there are no predators, why do you need to be able to fly? Instead, Galapagos cormorants have learned to swim very well so they can hunt for fish, shellfish, and other seafood. But if everything is clear and logical with cormorants, then some other animals can't be called anything but strange. Cyclops shark. What is that? It's even better. An albino cyclops shark. It's a cyclops shark. It's an exceptional case because there have never been international reports. It was caught off the coast of Mexico, and the very appearance of such a shark in the world is a bug of nature, and it's rather rare. The blobfish is a different story. It's sometimes called the ugliest creature on the planet. But how can something that looks like spoiled jelly even exist? The species is poorly studied, but scientists have figured out the real shape of the blobfish after all. The fish lives at depths of up to 4,000 feet, where it's subjected to tremendous pressure, and it looks like an ordinary fish. It only looks like a meme at the surface when the pressure suddenly decreases. Alas, the blobfish can't survive outside its usual conditions, apparently that's why it's so hard to study. But let's get out of the water. I found a couple more examples of nature's intervention, snub-nosed monkeys, and Ancol Watusi cows. Why did it take away the former's noses and put such huge horns on the ladder? They're obviously very heavy. How's it possible to walk at all with such a construction on the head? Well, sometimes nature does really cool things. Snub-nosed monkeys look like Voldemort. <laughs> Not because they experimented with horcrux, they live in mountain forests at high altitudes and often face extremely low temperatures. So to keep the poor primates from freezing their noses off, nature just took them. Except it didn't think about how they would look like, especially the infants. It's a good thing animals don't have a concept of beauty. It worked out the other way around with the Angle Watusi. They live in the hot regions of Africa, and they use their huge horns for thermoregulation. These horns are permeated by a system of vessels, and blood circulating back and forth is cooled by air currents. Then it returns to the body and lowers its temperature. Generally, you know, it's a good thing that cows need to be cooled and monkeys need to be warmed. Poor snub-nosed monkeys would have a hard time with those horns. Most animals have it easier. You won't encounter a white shark whose teeth have grown so big that they no longer fit in its mouth. You're unlikely to see an owl with a pelican-sized beak that grows endlessly because all of these things are clearly written into the genes of each species. Some variation is possible only in the case of a serious deviation, but not in donkeys. Nature really screwed up there. Has it ever occurred to you that hooves are in fact modified fingernails? And like any nails, sometimes they grow long enough that they need trimming. In the wild, animals do this on their own by just moving around a lot and sharpening their hooves naturally. But donkeys really have a problem with that. The fact is that they originated in the desert where the ground is hard, dry, and often rocky. Somehow after that, evolution decided that donkeys' hooves didn't need any upgrades. They turned out to be able to absorb moisture effectively, remain flexible, and avoid splitting and chipping. How cool is that? Yeah, let's get them into production. Unfortunately, in a typical horse pasture, this ability causes problems. The hooves don't wear out from walking, and there's also fungus with various bacteria in them. Five years without a manicure becomes a nightmare. Now, imagine for a moment that a few donkeys found themselves on an island with a mild, humid climate and no predators. Would they still walk around with their hooves bent, or would they have stopped walking altogether? If you want to feel like evolution, post your guesses in the comments. But while donkeys can still end up well without human intervention, it's a different story with sheep. 
Here, nature's in full swing. Not only can some of the sheep literally overgrow their wool to death, losing mobility and overheating, they also fall. They fall to their deaths. Okay, messes. How did you do this to yourself? And it's not just because of the height. Sometimes while walking in the countryside, you might notice a sheep lying on its back with its legs up. Now, it's not sunbathing, and it had no intention of taking that position at all. What are you doing? <laughs> the sheep's in trouble and I don't believe I said it. There could be several reasons for the sudden fall. Either the animal has too heavy, wet hair, or it's a pregnant female, or the sheep just got fat. Yeah, so much so that it can't roll over by accidentally losing its balance. Don't you think this feature would be worth fixing? Eh, nature? If nobody helps a fallen sheep, it suffocates. Wait, what? <laughs> so, that is a bog fast sheep. The fermentation of grass in the stomach produces gas, and if the sheep lies on its back, the gas can't escape. As it builds up, the pressure on the lungs increases, and the animal just suffocates. You know that feeling when you've eaten so much that you can't breathe? That's not a metaphor for sheep. And don't forget about predators. Wolves, crows, or even parrots. New Zealand Kia are happy to feed on dead sheep, but live sheep will do too. They're not very picky. What happened to the Kia is called exaptation. Due to the lack of other food, the parrots had to start hunting sheep. Another similar example is the vampire ground finches. I'm not kidding now. They live only on the Galapagos Islands and are similar to hundreds of other species of small birds on our planet, except that there weren't a lot of food on the islands and even less fresh water. So the finches have started drinking blood. Most of their menu includes blue-footed and Nazca boobies, and no one minds that the finch is making them to bleed with their sharp beaks. Scientists speculate that the finches once did this to rid the boobies of parasites and got their own food. And then, well, they seem to have developed a taste for it. Hey, Steve! Steve! I think you got a little carried away! Steve! Okay. Well, I'll just… yeah, I guess I'll wait. But nature doesn't just know how to take away some features or give animals extra problems. Sometimes it'll be like, vampire bats, check. Vampire birds, check. That's right, vampire deer, here are your fangs. The water deer is a completely unique animal. It eats grass, doesn't wear antlers, and has freaking enormous fangs. Strictly speaking, not every carnivore can boast such fangs. And here it is, a harmless ungulate. Why would a deer need something like that? Well, like I said, it doesn't seem to make much sense. Vampire teeth are only used by animals during fights over females. The rest of the time, they just dangle in their mouths and shift when a deer needs to eat. Nature, you're weird. Okay, now a word about the obvious stuff. Everyone knows what crocodiles look like. Even a young child will easily draw you something green, elongated with paws. In short, a toothy wiener. But if at some point you think the drawing isn't realistic enough, think again. Maybe the kid was just drawing a gavial. This crocodile looks like nature decided to do something unusual in the character editor, but didn't come up with anything worthwhile and just squeezed the face of the poor squeezed it, and then pulled it forward. The gavial's mouth is about five times as long as it was wide. Probably if the world of crocodiles had human laws, the gavial would have been simply laughed at in its neighborhood. But luckily, the elongated snout isn't just a whim of nature, but an actually useful thing. Most of a gavial's diet consists of fish, and that's what the funny face is for, as well as about a hundred small teeth. Add to that a relatively small weight for a crocodile, and you have the perfect angler. So nature's got it all figured out here. I don't think the gavials are offended. But imagine what would have happened if someone small got the huge face of a gavial. A deer? No, it has vampire fangs. A hare? Doesn't really suit it. Oh, hummingbirds. Just take away the teeth and here you have a sword-billed hummingbird. This is a unique creature among the birds. This tiny bird weighs not more than 0.5 ounces, and its beak, slightly turned up, is half the length of its body, sometimes even more. Seems like someone actually lied a lot. Okay, such an unusual organ helps them to get nectar from the long funnel-shaped flowers that other hummingbirds can't penetrate. In this way, the hummingbirds occupy their niche without competing with others, and at the same time provide pollination to a specific group of plants. Everyone is happy. but imagine Imagine, for a second, having such a huge stick constantly dangling in front of your face. It's uncomfortable. Yeah, hummingbirds don't like it either. For example, in the sitting position, the long beak pulls the bird down and it has to sit with its head held high for balance. Otherwise, the neck simply can't stand it. One can't clean feathers with such a beak. One has to use its legs. And during the flight, it's necessary to keep it in a certain position in order not to fall down. I guess it takes a hell of a lot of time for a sword-built hummingbird to just 
just learn how to live. We'll see you later.